Okay, we'll get started now. We'll get started now, so that's alright. Welcome, welcome to the talk tonight. It's the first in a series of lectures that UCC Atheist Society will be holding to mark the 150th anniversary of the publication of Origin of Species and Darwin's Bicentenary Year. Tonight's lecture will focus on the evolutionary psychology of religious belief. Are we born to believe in God? Is there, a, is there a God gene, so to speak? And there is probably no more qualified a speaker than tonight's to give this lecture. Dr. Dylan Evans studied at the London School of Economics, King's College London, and the University of Bath, and taught at the um, University of West of England before taking up his current position as a research scientist at UCC. He is a member of the Health Decision Making Research Group, a distinguished supporter of the British Humanist Association, a member of the Ethics Advisory Board of the Lifeboat Foundation, and a, member, a member of the British Fulbright Scholars Association. In 2001, he was voted one of the 20 best young writers in Britain by the Independent on Sunday newspaper. He continues to write regularly for The Guardian and is the author of several popular science books, including Emotion, Evolution and Rationality, Placebo, The Belief Effect, and Emotion, The Science of Sentiment. Any of you who attended the recent philosophical debate on medicine versus miracles will have seen his impassioned defense of the scientific method, his extolling of rationality and reason, and his unwavering critique of pseudo-scientific claims. Somewhat disconcertingly, however, for those of us on the floor who rode behind this pitiless display of erudition, Dr. Evans is reportedly later, later seen curing a leper in the Cane Car Park. But in spite of popular claims to the contrary, we're a charitable bunch, and so we're prepared to hear him out anyway. Um, with that, I'll hand you over to Dr. Evans, and his books are for sale in all good bookshops, and uh, <laughs> he, isn't, he, isn't, he isn't here for purely charitable reasons, despite what I may <laughs> suggest, but uh, please welcome Dr. Evans. Thanks very much for inviting me, and thanks for uh, coming to hear this, uh, this talk. Just for, before we actually start the talk, I just wonder if we could get a rough uh, show of hands. How many people here believe in God? Just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so I'm preaching to the converted, or non-converted, How many people are atheists? Okay. How many people did not raise their hand for either of the first two questions? What was that? Are you an agnostic? Agnostic. Yeah. Agnostic. Are you an agnostic? Yeah. Okay. You. Are you an agnostic? Or just too afraid to say you're an idiot? <laughs> um, okay. So the title of the talk: Born to Believe. Evolution, psychology, and religion. Uh, we've got. A, I want to start off with a, a working definition of religion, and this is just a working definition. There's whole books written about how we should define religion, so this does not pretend to be a definitive answer. Hopefully, it's just good enough to get us uh, through this talk. Um, I'm just borrowing a definition that Dan Dennett provides in his 2006 book, Breaking the Spell: Religion as a natural phenomenon, and he defines religion or provides the following working definition of religion in that book. A religion is a social system, and that's important so we can distinguish it from schizophrenia, whose participants avow belief in and seek the approval of one or more supernatural agents. Okay, now if you look up, the reason I mentioned schizophrenia is because if you, if you look in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, the only they specifically have to mention in their definition of uh, schizophrenia and related psychiatric phenomena that the delusion is not shared by a great number of people in order to differentiate schizophrenia from religion because in, it, uh, without that clause it's very often very hard to do so. 
but certainly when those forms of schizophrenia don't involve hallucinations but just involve delusions, for example. How do you define a delusion? According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, it's the something bizarre, and how do you def make sure that it's bizarre? It's, it's, it's because it's not shared by a wide number of people. In other words, uh, as uh, Winston Smith says in um, 1984, sanity is statistical. Uh, the key part of uh, the, other, the other key part of religion, of course, is that it involves some kind of uh, belief in and or approve, seeking the approval of or commitment to supernatural agents, by which I mean beings who have intentions, uh, thoughts, and so on, um, but who are not natural agents that we're accustomed to. They may not have physical bodies and so on. Um, all religions have expensive rituals, and by expensive, what I mean there is uh, something that is not necessarily expensive in money, but is costly in terms of the kind of resources we use up uh, in participating in these rituals, the costly in terms of time, pr practice, rehearsal, and so on. Uh, they all involve stories about gods or supernatural ancestors and obligatory practices other than rituals and taboos or forbidden behaviors. So um, if we can just stay with that as a rough working definition of religion, it's enough to allow us to sort of begin to think about the history of religion. Now, the history of religion is something that is, is still uh, a work in progress. It still remains to be, uh, a lot of things are still mysterious. But going back, it's helpful to just to give a very rough um, overview of what we know sort of starting with the present and working back, just so we can see how ancient it is. So if we, these are numbers down the, the side here, designate years before the present. So between zero, the moment, and a thousand years ago, in the last thousand years we have the life of Guru Nanak, founder of the uh, Sikhism, Martin Luther, Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, then, between a thousand years ago um, and two thousand years ago, the life of Muhammad. Then, a thousand years after that, roughly, in the next millennium before the present, the life of Zoroaster, the Buddha, Mahavira, Jainism, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Jesus. So you notice that, and then Abraham, David, all that, and the Torah. So all the major world religions that have such a powerful force today, come from the last couple of thousand years. But if we go before that, we find, you know, there's uh, the earliest Vedas were probably composed in, in the uh, fourth millennium before the present. Also other religious texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh and so on. Um, if we, let's see if we can... So, um, Sorry, the earliest Vedas, that would be in the, still in the third millennium. The four, um, in the fourth millennium, we have New Grange is, uh, is built, and Stonehenge begins to take, uh, sorry, sorry that, the fourth millennium, Stonehenge begins to take its final form, and the wooden stones are replaced with, uh, wooden posts are replaced with stones, then New Grange. If we go further back, um, around, uh, 10,000 years before the present, Stonehenge seems to have had some wooden posts. The settlements uh, in Anatolia, possibly um, practicing worship in communal shrines, leaving figurines behind them. And then around 12,000 years ago, the first cities, states, kingdoms begin to emerge, and the first organized religions emerge as a response to the social, economic, and political changes brought about by agriculture. And the advent of agriculture is such a hugely important transition in human history, the most important transition by any reckoning, that I've uh, indicated that by the change of color there. But of course, those organized religions didn't come from nowhere. Those organized religions must have come from, so they, they didn't spring out of nothing. They probably came from older forms of folk religion that still shared the, the main characteristics that we talked about, expensive rituals, 
stories about gods and supernatural beings and ancestors and so on, taboos, but they probably lacked very clear hierarchies. And that seems to be one of the main differences between folk religions and organized religions, the kind that appear with uh, civilization and agriculture, is this clear hierarchies, and then later, of course, written creeds. But before then, we have these more folk religions. Um, maybe there's some, sh some uh, differentiation between shamans and others, although the shaman isn't necessarily a part of a hierarchy like a priest is. Um, but before